uh, for legal reasons I cannot mention his or her name um, and I had this interview so what's, what's their name? I can't but from that point onwards Sean I've only realised that it is a rigged system I looked straight in the face and said so you want me to be a spy? you want me to spy in my own community? There are journalists out there who use their Muslim identity to spy on their community. Baroness Manningham Buller, people. Go Google her name. The former head of the MI5, she advised Blair, don't go into Iraq. There was no Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Al-Qaeda came into Iraq after the war. I said pay for everyone adequately for what Britain has taken from the Indian subcontinent and you'll see that we will go back. He goes, oh, what do you think that is? Obviously, obviously it exceeds 33 pounds. G-Unit! Future generations will read about this particular period and think, wow, what a unique time to live in. I was just waiting for the right time for me to uh, congratulate you on your, on your much. Attention number two sees this post up. Baji, the hair's not done, mate. Jello. You don't worry about number two now, you just got married. Number two, uh, I did mine in the morning. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I came across this in my files. I keep files on them. I know that I have to submit to the local culture and language always. Really? Really? We've got hundreds if not thousands of European expats in the Arab world. Are they forced to speak Arabic? No, they're not. It's a, it's a shame that you've brought uh, Miss Bartlett here who presents herself as an independent journalist. She's neither independent and nor can she even quantify or qualify as a journalist. I don't think I need to subscribe to a, an arbitrary set of values to show my humanity or decency or even loyalty to this country. And a repetitive motive that keeps on coming out from the perpetrators are foreign policy grievances. That's the elephant in the room. Let's let's take heed and look at what we can do to prevent and make our streets safer. Assalamu alaikum guys and welcome to Declassified episode two. Where I've got brother Dili Hussein with us today. Assalamualaikum. Walaikum assalam. Jazakallah khair for Barakallah Fiq for having me. Ah, alhamdulillah. You guys may recognize Dili from BBC, from Channel 4, from Sky News, from Huffington Post, from Al Jazeera, uh, and some unknown website called Five Pillars as well. <laughs> oh, well, that's a bit below the belly, isn't it? That's the one that's supposed to come first. Oh my god. Hello. But alhamdulillah, uh, I've also. Um, seen the brother from oh this is quite loud for me i've also seen the brother from five pillars as well and i thought you know what these brothers are doing some excellent work uh we've got to support each other we've got to benefit from each other these brothers are on the front line uh doing the jihad and uh you know sorting out the kuffar <laughs> <laughs> listen listen uh let's just let's contextualize some of these things later on in the podcast yeah Inshallah bro, Inshallah, yeah. you Muslims. Yeah. Uh, what I'm going to do in this podcast, I'm going to play devil's advocate or shaitan's advocate. Yeah. Just play the, an opposing advocate, you don't have to play the shaitan's that's, advocate. That's, that's, that's Honestly. true, you know, uh, I'm quite embarrassed now. Yeah. Astaghfirullah. <laughs> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. What keeps you pumped though? What's your drive? Why, why bother bro? Why bother? Because we live in a time where Islam and Muslims are being presented in a manner in which is is uh, not only untrue, but it's, it's, it's presented in a way in which we, we are somehow an existential threat to humanity. Extraterrestrial? No, existential. What does that mean? Like we, pro we propose some kind of threat to the very existence of humanity. Okay. Right. So the predominant way of life would, in this day and age, would be secular liberalism or liberal democracy. What does that mean, bro? Sec secular liberalism. Few people have used that. I've never actually had a chance to go to the dictionary. Okay. Well, in in, in very simple term form, secularism is the ideology or the way of thought whereby religion, and politics or the state are kept separate. So religion has no role in, in in the public sphere. Liberalism is obviously you get different strands of liberalism but generally liberalism is the 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 the, the ideology or the philosophy whereby uh, utilitarianism or the individual um, has the right to do 
whatever he pleases or she pleases so long as it does not infringe on the rights of others uh, uh, okay. uh, put those two together and you have the predominant societies which we find ourselves in today look when i was doing uh, my politics degree at the university of east anglia at that time uh, in terms of a career i wanted to be part of the civil service uh, my two sisters uh, work in immigration uh, they're civil servants um, and i wanted to follow their footsteps and you know that was the that was the journey I, I wanted to take. However, 2006 to 2009 was a very crucial period for the Muslim community in the UK. We saw the birth of the like of of, of uh, discriminatory uh, policies like the Prevent Strategy. We saw Iraq, we saw Afghanistan, and and that kind of whole war on terror narrative continued. And you and I, I believe, we're the same age or around about. Yeah. So we we are what's known as the war on terror generation, mm. right? Um, meaning that we grew up uh, in, in, in a society, in a world whereby Islam and Muslim was presented from the prism of counter-terrorism. That's how we understand what our religion, our faith means from the entities and the, and the institutions that exist. Mm. Now, when I, gr when I graduated, I no longer wanted to be part of the Home Office. Yeah. I no longer wanted to work in immigration or be a civil servant mm -hmm. um, because I felt that Whilst I'm a citizen of this country, I want to contribute positively for the betterment of this society. I didn't want to be part of the very establishment which I felt was oppressing my people. Okay. So I, I considered journalism. Uh, and then I did my NCTJ, which is the National Certificate for the Training of Journalists. Every print journalist must have this qualification or else they won't be able to work in the realm of print, news, uh, print newspapers. And that's when you learn T-line, news writing, media law, public affairs for local and central government, all that kind of stuff. Alhamdulillah, I passed that in 2010. And I did a placement, and this is an exclusive story just for your podcast. I've never shared it with anyone else. But since you wanted to know an event or an experience, I had an internship at the Daily Mirror. Yeah. And I completed my internship. And the natural progression is to then seek a job as a trainee reporter, right? Um, so there was an opening and I applied for it. And I had an interview with one of the editors. Uh, for legal reasons, I cannot mention his or her name. Um, and I had this interview. So what's, what's their name? I can't. Seriously, bro. No, you have to pay the lawsuit out, isn't it? Yeah, I don't think uh, you've got the money to do yeah, that. Well, they, with 100,000 YouTube subscribers, <laughs> you should be able to raise that quickly. <laughs> So it was his name Dave? <laughs> <laughs> no, very anyway, The editor put the CV down and said, right, okay, um, what have you really got to offer us? Okay, you've done your internship, you passed your NCTJ, what is it that you're offering us? And me being a very, at the time, a very, uh, you know, an idealistic and, a, you know, excessively optimistic journalist at the time, thinking I'm going to change the whole way that Islam and Muslims have been presented alone, yeah? Mm. I said, look, you know, the, the, main, <clears throat> the mainstream press is not trusted within Muslim communities justifiably yeah. and so therefore the Daily Mirror and other mainstream uh, newspapers need to start recruiting Muslims who have a grassroots uh, following or can access the grassroots um, so whenever an incident happens you can speak to the right people yeah. instead of having to uh, interview the likes of I don't know Quilliam Foundation or uh, you know um, New Horizons for British Islam or British Muslim for Secular Democracy all puppets and jokers who have absolutely no followings whatsoever have never spoken at a masjid have never been invited by an ISOC literally have zero following they're literally there just to make funding from the government mm. she and then this editor turned around and said to me okay Dilly but what I'd like you to do or where I see you your role in a paper like Daily Mirror is for you to access your community or communities across the country. Think about it. This is an editor yeah. of a national news, national tabloid. Yeah. The editor basically said, I see your role in this establishment as someone who can access communities and really tackle the issue of radicalization from within. So I looked at... Being a spook, in other words. Yeah. Exactly. I'm telling you that I want to report objective fair news yeah. by accessing mainstream organizations with grassroots following yeah. and that way I can give you the, the, the real perspective of Muslim affairs in turn you have turned around and said to me that you see my role is essentially uh, surveillance yeah. and accessing my own community and, and basically going to masjids or going to certain events and come back with dirt because someone may have um, said something uh, out of context may, or take a soundbite from one scholar mm -hmm. or something like this. I, I looked straight in the face, I said, so you want me to be a spy? 
You want me to spy in my own community? Oh, no, 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 no. Dude, look, we do have a radicalization problem. You know this and I know uh, this. And who else better to access it? So the editor was carrying on. Yeah. yeah. I left the room. I left the room. And wallahi, from that point onward, I realized that the mainstream media or seeking a career in the mainstream media is something which uh, I will not get that far in. Not with my values and principles and ethics, which is shaped by Islam. I will not be able to do it. I thought I could join a mainstream newspaper or a mainstream channel, uh, change perceptions, mm. you know, give the British public the real perspective of British Muslims, right? By getting the right people to comment, by getting the right people to interview, you know, and I thought, yeah, I could do this. But from that point onwards, Sean, I've only realized that it is a rigged system. Mm. It's a rigged system. Because what's interesting here is people would look at you and say, oh, here's someone that made it out and, you know, went and worked for this unknown website. Mm. Five, six pillars, five, five, five pillars. Five pillars. Five pillars. <laughs> okay, so what, what's interesting here, people are going to look at what you're doing yeah. uh, and, and say that, look, he made, his, uh, he made his escape. But what's interesting is not everyone's going to take the route that you did. There will actually be, and there are journalists that would say, you know what? If it fills my pockets and lines my pockets, I'll do that. Does do you know personally people who are in the system that this is all they do? You don't have to share their names. There are journalists out there who use their Muslim identity to spy on their community. And they know exactly what they're doing. When they attend an Islamic conference and a scholar is talking about a particular aspect of the religion, they will purposely take a five seconds to stand by, knowing full well that the whole lecture contextualize a particular theological position or juristic position and they will go and feed that back to the editors and they'll get a byline and a splash and, and that'll hit the news and before you know it whichever scholar that they decided to malign um, is now an extremist mm. right there was this bit I think you were on the BBC I think it was that Sunday Sunday night thing where you were with uh, a few people because forget the name of the show Riley you know what? BBC Sunday know. morning live oh is it that is it that and and there was this guy bro he was cringing me out man like he was saying the things that honestly uh, you don't expect any educated person in this day and age to say. The guy graduated from Oxford. Okay. He was he he, he was at the university at the same time as David Cameron, mm. and and yeah he was. Mad. Yeah, and 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 the and the discussion for that particular show was, should we be proud of Britain's wars? Yeah. yeah that yeah. was the topic of discussion, and so I said, Winston Churchill specifically. So I said, look for me. As a Muslim of Bengali origin, I find it very difficult to take anything positive from Britain's wars, let alone Winston Churchill. Why? Because Britain has a long history of colonizing vast swathes of not just the Muslim majority world, yeah. just the vast swathes of the world. Yeah. They were involved in the transatlantic slave trade. They were involved in colonizing the Middle East and Africa and Asia, setting up the East India Trade Company. And we see, sadly, the, 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 the repercussions and, and, and the unfortunate situation in these parts of the world even till today. However, I specifically mentioned the Bengal famine. The Bengal famine was an artificial famine which was purposely imposed by Winston Churchill whereby he withheld rice from the people of Bengal so he can fund Britain's war effort. As a result, up to 3 million Bengalis died. Conservative estimate. Yeah. Conservative estimate is 1.5 million. Okay. So if you speak to a non-European historian, they'll say to you up to 3 million. Whereas a European historian would probably say to you around one and a half million. Some say even five million. Some too say five million. But can you see how we're just saying these numbers? Like, yeah. Think about the number one and a half million. Mad. It's a lot of people. It could it was potentially went up to three to five. How can I, sitting on this chair on that show that day, as someone of Bengali er or origin, as someone whose great grandparents could have been affected by this, say to you that I'm proud of Winston Churchill and proud of Britain's wars? And when I said no, he went crazy. Oh, but, you know, you must be happy here. Oh, but come on, you know. It's patronizing. Hey, of course it's patronizing because you're going on like I'm a guest in this country. I'm not, I was born yeah, here. Yeah. I was born here. And, 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 and sadly, when you speak to individuals of this mindset, you need to remind them that the reason why our forefathers from the Indian subcontinent and other part of the British Empire came to England is because there was a major population crisis after World War II. The ratio to men to women, I believe, was one to four or one to three. 
Can you imagine? So they that? didn't have a choice but to come here. Of course, because the women, or else you'd have women working in factories. Who would marry them, have children with them during the 40s after World War II? Yeah. So they needed a labor force to come to the UK because so many men had died in World War II. Hence, you saw the first wave wow. of, men, of economic migrants from India, well, at the time, India and Pakistan, the West Indies. They came here because Britain needed them to rebuild the economy. There was no men to do the work, right? That's mad. So, so considering that, and we're now third, fourth generation, I was born here. I'm as British as you, sir, right? Mm. So I can criticize this government, I can criticize its history as much as you, but because you still see me as a colonial subject, yeah. you, cannot, you cannot even fathom yeah. that uh, you know, a colored person is here talking like this about British history, you know? If you're unhappy with all this, bro, we still do go back home. Why? Go back to Bangladesh, bro. Why? But that's, you know, when I hear this, yeah. and, and, and I hear this from family members, but that's what kills yeah. it the most. Oh, if you're so happy, in the, unhappy in this country, then go back from where you come from. No, yeah. how, how about uncle, you go back where you come from. I was born here, quite, quite thank you. I'm okay here. Why can I, yeah. as a British citizen, not have the access and to just share my thoughts? If a white uh, middle class individual said exactly the same things I do, yeah. it'll be celebrated as an alternative uh, perspective or as, or, or as or as something of balance when russell brand says the same thing i do yeah. no one tells him to go back to his country but there's certain things which people of color i.e non-white caucasians say about colonial past or or the present uh, foreign policy or issues that are taking place and all of a sudden we're lynched we're seen as unpatriotic disloyal unappreciative subjects of of the empire and that's not true we were born here we're allowed surely muslims must be the problem if everyone is mentioning muslims if they weren't the problem why on earth would everybody keep mentioning them day in day out early 20th century late 19th century you know demonizing jews was the in thing in europe even in the british press they were the boogie people the people who looked different dressed different spoke differently, ate differently, you know, the women wore different kind of clothes, they got this thing called kosher which they eat, they were demonized all across Europe, obviously other countries excelled in their demonization than others which unfortunately led to the incident of the Holocaust, but don't get it twisted, even when the Nazis were carrying out the Holocaust, there was still anti-Semitism in France and Britain and elsewhere, and there was a culture of demonizing Jews, were Jews the problem? Absolutely not. If you go back even further, you will find, especially during the period of Guy Fawkes, you know, remember, remember the 5th of November, gunpowder, treason and plot. You know, Gee, you net. Yeah. Now, there was a major, there was a major demonization process of Roman Catholics. When Britain decided that they were going to become Protestants, there was a major, major witch hunt for, for Roman Catholics in mm -hmm. British society, right? And you had the same with uh, the Irish in Britain, you had the same with uh, the African Caribbean who were perceived as thugs and robbers and thieves and drug dealers and they were constantly demonized in the British press then you had it with the Irish and the IRA and you've got the Muslims which have been the last 16-17 years whenever a respective government or establishment is lacking and failing in their own responsibilities to their, to their societies and their people they tend to start shifting the blame and scapegoating minorities. This is an age-old tactic. Yeah, but Muslims are killing people though, bro. Why are we so angry, bro? Surely it is. Maybe it is Islam. No, it's not Islam. You have to understand that when Muslims and people of colour... Remember, I'm, not just, I'm just not just limiting this anger to Muslims. I'm, I'm including people of colour, people from the continent of Africa and South America and, and all sorts. You know, there is a long recorded history of a brutal policy of colonization in these lands yeah and i'm talking about millions and millions of people being killed enslaved exploited the natural resources of these respective countries stolen and then later monopolized by multi-trillionaire corporations we are coming from a perspective in terms of understanding anger as you said the iraq war where at least one million people were killed, bro. Mm. Ba and a war which was waste, uh, waged on false intelligence, on false confessions. 
one million people. I want people who are listening to this podcast to just ponder about the numbers that we're talking about. When a single family member passes in your in your household, how do you feel? We are now talking about a million. A million in Iraq, 50,000 in Afghanistan, a million and a half to three million, possibly five million in the Bengal famine. Just think about these numbers. There was no Al-Qaeda before the war in Afghanistan against the Russians. There was no ISIS before the invasion of Iraq. President Barack Obama and Tony Blair have both been on record saying that the war in Iraq created the vacuum in which ISIS was born. Given that, how is it that Western governments are surprised when retaliatory attacks take place? How, why are you surprised that you've allowed someone like Bashar al-Assad to kill nearly half a million of his people, but never once intervened? But as soon as this group called ISIS came about, took over a city on Raqqa, kidnapped a few uh, British aid workers, all of a sudden you created a 60-70 nation coalition to bomb ISIS. But you allowed Bashar to do what he did for three to five years. Of course, if you're going to bomb them in Raqqa, that you're going to have some retaliatory attacks in the, in the West. Of course, this is normal. You punch and kick and bomb and bully someone, at some point there will be an equal reaction or some form of reaction. And why is it that the term terrorism, a highly politicized term, is only restricted to non-state actors? What I mean by non-state actors is that the violence, the industrial scale violence of states is nearly always ignored or downplayed. As if this was something that was justified because it was carried out by a state. Baroness Manningham Buller, people, go Google her name. The former head of the MI5, she advised Blair, don't go into Iraq, because if we go into Iraq, there's going to be things happening here which we won't be able to contain. Muhammad Sadiq, one of the bombers of the 7-7 so attacks. Why, why did he go into Iraq then if he was warned by his own um, security officials? So WikiLeaks uh, revelations as well as admissions from the former uh, Bush administration have said that Blair was strong-armed by uh, Bush and obviously there was uh, the whole issue of Saddam not towing the line so this whole false information about him harboring uh, Al-Qaeda Al-Qaeda members as well as possessing weapons of mass destruction by the way where are those WMDs when Al-Qaeda only came from Iraq after the invasion there was no Al-Qaeda in Iraq Al-Qaeda came into Iraq after the war Mm. Yeah, the Islamic State of Iraq and, and the Council of Mujahideen and, and all these different groups that were affiliated to Al-Qaeda They came 2-3 years after the invasion of Iraq So let's say his arms were held uh, what, Apart from the oil yeah. this, uh, that, That's one of the reasons they want to go in oil. What, what other reasons could there be for them to secure Iraq? Because by securing Iraq you then create a buffer between Iran and Syria and you now have a physical uh, foot on the ground with regards to a strategic place in the Middle East. And Iraq is a strategic uh, location in the whole of Middle East. And whoever has control of Iraq essentially will have uh, an advantage point with regards to the geopolitics, geopolitics of this region. And that's not something which is unique to this period. Everyone knows, even dating back to the time of uh, the Sahaba and the Khulafa al-Rashidin, Controlling Iraq yeah, was, was a big thing. Was a big thing. Kufa, yeah. Right? Kufa, uh, Baghdad, uh, the River Tigris, and and so forth. You know, it was a strategic place in the Middle East, and it always has been. Um, the Ottomans and the Safavids fought over it. And what's interesting is when you speak to a lot of uncles, mm. this is their justification. They say, "Oh, you're in this country. They they put a roof over your head. They've done this. They've done that. Uh, so therefore, you should uh, toe the line. Oh. You should." Uh, integrate slash even assimilate yeah. depending on the uncle you're speaking to and and uh, how brainwashed they are yeah. once you explain to the uncle what actual cultural assimilation that the British establishment and its respective think tanks would like Muslims to see they won't like it 
Mm. When you explain to them that they want our sisters and our women folk to do X, Y, and Z, yeah. they want our youth to be involved in X, Y, and Z. This is the kind of thing that they want us to believe and adopt. Then you'll see that our uncle, you know, he would think very differently. And even if he pays lip service to accepting these things nominally, once he hits his own doorstep, he'll but he'll realize. Yeah. Yeah. He realize okay, maybe this whole assimilation thing wasn't as 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 good as I thought it was. And then, but but you have to remind uncle, I'm going out and doing 40 hours a week to f- support my family. The government ain't working on my behalf. If they gave me a salary of 30, 40, 50 grand Mufteni for no reason, for free, then I yeah, could understand. Exactly. But they're not. I'm working 40 hours. I'm paying my taxes. Or whatever work that you do, or whatever hard work you do to earn and survive and provide for your family, it's, your it's from your own back. Yeah. It's from your own back, right? Um, and you know, with all due respect, I mean, I've, I did say this to um, uh, a, a, a member of UKIP that I once had an off-camera conversation with. I said, look, I'll go back to my country or my country of origin. Well, he told you go back to your country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, look, but I'll go back. Oh, no, 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 because UKIP had a policy of uh, repatriation, isn't it? Like to send uh, people of uh, ethnic minority back to their countries Mad. with compensation, though. Why? Right? So I said, fine. Yeah. If you compensate me and you uh, basically give me this, mu- this much money and you not only kick me out, but you have to kick all my family members out because home is, what is home without friends and family, right? Mm. Right? That's what essentially makes a home, yeah. your friends and family. family yeah. And then you adapt to whatever respective culture that you're in. I said, pay for everyone adequately for what Britain has taken from the Indian subcontinent and you'll see that we will go back. He goes, oh, what do you think that is? Because he exceeds 30 trillion pounds. Do you net? Yeah, 30 trillion. So just, in, so just in case you don't know how it works, a thousand... A thousand thousands is a million, a thousand millions is a billion, and a thousand billion is a trillion. I thought you were just going to say 30, 40 K, bro. No, you know. They say that Britain had looted India of nearly 30 trillion pounds of today's money. Looted? What did they take from there? I don't see anything. Tea? Uh, tea, bro, you can get a pound from... No, no, not there. those times, bro. Oh. Natural tea leaves, jewels... Precious stones. Yeah, they've got that right? in the thing. Yeah, uh, agri- museums. Uh, agricultural lands, which were owned and were milked and were farmed, and all the produce was then taken and sold. On who was farming them though? Oh, the Indians were. We were. Well, out we, of choice. We, yeah, no. We, we got a portion of. We got a pat on the back and a bit of a salary for farming our own lands that were stolen from us. Hmm. You know, all the jewels and all the possessions of the Mughals and and all the all the, the, the the Maharajas that owned whatever they owned. The resources, but mainly it was tea, precious stones, and the agricultural land, which was then used. Spices as well. Spices, of course. Yeah. How could I forget spices? All of these things. Now, you may think, okay, how much does a pack of marcha cost these days? That's yeah? what I'm saying. But 75 not, pence, mate. No, but back in those times, those things were traded and sold. £1.50. No, no. It wasn't, certainly wasn't £1 fish or nothing like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was nothing like that. that those, those things were very expensive and. and, and when he heard 30 trillion pounds, this UKIP member that I had an off-camera, off-camera discussion with, he's like, I don't believe you. Let's go do your own research. Yeah, where did you get that number from though? Um, Jeremy Paxman mentioned a figure, not 30 trillion, but certainly within the trillions. Um, I also recall it being mentioned um, by Shashi Tahoor. I, I believe that's how you pronounce his name. Yeah, another Bollywood actor. No, no, no. He's a congressman politician from India. Oh. There's an intentional conflation by certain certain entities within our societies that if you criticize the British government or its history or the army, that somehow you're an enemy within. Mm. Something with Saeed Warsi, uh, that was the title of her book. As it currently stands, I believe, not verbatim, the way an extremist is defined under the prevent strategy is someone who doesn't believe in Brit- fundamental British values. Fundamental British values is uh, democracy, the rule of law, uh, mutual tolerance, uh, and freedom of expression and sexuality. If you don't believe in one or four of these things, as it's understood and defined, not in your mind, the way those four things are defined by the Tories who, who pulled out this whole notion of fundamental British values. If you don't believe these things, then you are an extremist. Not I am a Muslim and I believe democracy is shura. No, 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 no. They're saying that democracy as being the best form of governance for mankind. Mad. Yeah. Uh, freedom of expression. Ah, oh, yeah. So you can criticize Islam and, you know, we can have a, a respect. No, they're talking about insulting the Prophet here. Mm. Yeah. 
um, you know, stuff like, you know, the rule of law. Yeah, so you accept the rule of law, but you will remain silent when it's unjust laws. Yeah. Mm. So, you know, we have this set of arbitrary values, which then de defines who is and isn't an extremist. That's what we need to be mindful when we use these terms. Because people think, oh, when, you know, the media and the government are talking about extremists, they're talking about ISIS. No, they're not talking about ISIS only. Those are, in their eyes, those are violent extremists. Non-violent extremists includes your Sufis, your Salafis, your Diobandis, your Ikhwani and Jamatis, your HTs, and everything within. Essentially, if you are an orthodox practicing Muslim who believes that Islam as a deen has the answers for all of mankind's affairs, both private and public, and that certain things are unequivocally haram, and some things are unequivocally absolutely from our religion, you are an extremist in the eyes of the establishment and the media institutions, sadly. Then why is it that criticism of a country or your respective government has to be seen as negative or, or, or an existential threat? No, we, you know, activists and academics and people say things to prevent further problems, right? So when I say that Britain should stop bombing other countries, I'm saying it so other people don't come and bomb this country. Yeah. Yeah. Or people who have an affinity and link to the countries that you're going and causing problems in don't decide one day to do something here. Mm. My sisters use public transport. My wife uses public transport. My family uses public transport. Right. They could be killed in one of these attacks. Why would I want that? So therefore, when we provide this critique, Evidence-based critique. Things which essentially have been advised by security advisors. Again, I'm telling you guys to Google Baroness Manningham Buller. She is just one prominent individual who advised against Britain going into Iraq. There are many others like her. We are only reiterating things that have already been said. Look, you would never say to a victim of rape that don't say that you're a victim of rape. Of course not. You would mm. never say that. Mm. Someone who's been raped or someone who's been abused, you will never say to them, stop victimizing or having a victimized complex by keep on going on about what was happening to you. That's that you would never say that. It's disgusting. Mm. But essentially, we, the Muslim majority world, as well as parts of large swathes of other parts of the world, the Caribbean, the South Americas, Africa, you know, they have been politically raped and economically raped. Mad. Right? Which has shaped the psyche, the mindset, the attitudes, the behaviorisms of how the people of these respective regions now behave in the host country. Yeah, I'm saying I'm using these terms because that's how these things are perceived as. So people have justifiable reasons to be angry. People have justifiable reasons to be uh, to have grievances, but we air them in a manner in which is first and foremost legal. For Muslims, one which is Islamic with the correct other, right? And we use the means available to us, so as long as it's halal, to air these views. Noam Chomsky said, in some of our countries, there's no freedom of speech. And that's, okay, fair enough. When he says our country, we say the Muslim majority world. Yeah, the okay. Muslim majority world, there's yeah. not freedom of speech, mm. uh, or very little. But in countries like this that profess to have freedom of speech, they may have freedom of speech, but Noam, Noam Chomsky said, that's at the cost of your freedom of thought. Now your thought has to be in molded line, yeah in line. and that's where pro propaganda comes in and that and this is Edward Bernays and absolutely and this is and this is what this is this is why I said to you earlier on in this podcast that we need to be careful not to use the word assimilation because what Noam Chomsky is talking about here is an intellectual assimilation whereby we feel that we can say whatever we want but we can't actually think whatever we want you, you also it reminded me of one thing in, in the empire I don't know if this is true or not is it true that when the British went in they said we want them outwardly to look like um, you know brown Indians or whatever but in Side, we want them to talk like us, absolutely. think like us. Absolutely, this was this was not only a policy by the British, but even Napoleon Bonaparte. He said when he went to Egypt, he goes, "I'm I'm happy for the Egyptians to have their beards and the women to be covered the way they are and the men to wear their gowns, but so as long as they are French in their values and French in their thinking, this is what is most important to us. Mm. They can read their Quran as much as they want, so as long as that Quran remains." Just as mere utterance And it was, it was an age-old colonial policy, bro mm. uh, That, you know, the British, the Dutch, the Portuguese the Sp well, not, the, not the Spanish, but certainly Britain, France and the, and, and the Dutch 
They had no problem with you being outwardly whatever identity you want to subscribe to. But intellectually, in your mindset, the way you thought um, that you had to be in line with what was the predominant colonial uh, structure of the time. Very similar to the arguments that you hear in this day and age. Oh, but that you're allowed to pray and you're allowed to give zakah. And, you know, we have, yeah. 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 And so praying salah in the masjid is okay. Giving your zakah to a charity is okay. Hagging halal meat is okay. Then providing a, 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 a Muslim cemetery to bury our people is okay. So therefore, that means, because of those facilities, which by the way, were essentially founded from the hard work of the first generation of Muslims. They worked. So, so you know how in our day and age, Zishan now, it's obviously giving da'wah, activism, raising awareness about X, Y and Z. Mm. The struggle of our fathers and our forefathers was building the institutions to merely survive as a Muslim community. Mm. So making sure that there were masjids, making sure that there were Hajj and Umrah operators, making sure that there was uh, Muslim cemeteries, making sure that there were halal butchers. This was their battle mm. in the 50s, 60s and 70s, right? Yeah. And Alhamdulillah, they did that from their hard work. It wasn't just handed to them on a plate. So that's why I get a bit baffled sometimes thinking that, but the British government didn't just give you yeah. a piece of place in the cemetery. You had to pay and, 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 and lobby for that. They didn't just give you a masjid for free. You had to do collection around the community to build that. Mm. So this whole kind of, this colonial complex, that because we're allowed to do X, Y and Z, we cannot do A, B and C. Because we can pray and have halal meat and they allow us, they allow our, even this is being a question now, they're allowing our, our, few, our women folk to wear hijab in schools and stuff, that oh, Therefore, we shouldn't criticize them when they do something, or we shouldn't criticize them when they're doing something abroad. Yeah, or you know, we, we shouldn't criticize them for something they've done 100, 200 years ago, as if what happened 100, 200 years ago is absolutely unrelated to what's happening now. If you speak to a European academic, right, and say to him, How did Europe uh, arrive at the situation that it finds itself in today, mm. as in like global leaders in nearly every facet of life? They'll say to you, Well, we had the period of European colonialism. But before that, what happened then? Okay, we had the Industrial Revolution. Okay, but before that, what happened? Uh, we had the period of Enlightenment. Okay, but what happened before that? Oh, we had the Renaissance. Okay. So there's, if they can link back, if they can trace back, like Yani, this is a consensus. There's an ijma amongst academics and European thinkers and historians that Britain, France and other European nations have arrived in the very... Uh, prestigious role in, 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 in on earth today along with America but that's obviously a different history World War II and all that kind of stuff that they arrived and got to where they are because of very key events in their history which dates all the way back to the Renaissance which then dates back to the Crusades because how did Greek literature and Greek sciences and how did these things get revived in Europe it was from the translations of the Arabs how did they get that they got that from Muslim Spain and they got that from the interaction of the Muslims in Crusades. Again, I'm not saying that everything that great has happened to Europe was due to the Muslims. Well, maybe mm. I am. But the point <laughs> here is that the, the, the lesson we take from this whole thing that I'm saying is that events which date back hundreds of years um, has an, uh, a direct effect on your current reality. We need to start accepting that as Muslims in this country, we are stakeholders. We have... We have things to contribute, good things to go, and we should not just be followers and sheep, we should be the leaders. And what better, better thing do we have to offer society than our Islamic tradition and the ethics and the principles and the ideas and the beliefs that emanate from this tradition? So as long as it does not compromise the core beliefs and practice of your religion. Bro, I, I can't do that. I was, I was just waiting for the right time for me to... Uh... Congratulate you on your My on much, your much. Much kuch nahi, you know. Bro, it's glorious. Ah, oh, that's a bit excessive. <laughs> it's a bit excessive. I envy your beard. I envy men with beards. <laughs> no, seriously, I do. My hair doesn't grow here. Really? Yeah, it just grows here. It's good you've clarified that because some people may have judged you already. Or oh yeah, they probably they probably would have written me off already. But yeah, but yeah. my hair does not grow here, so it grows here. Which is quite common amongst Bengalis and Malaysians and Indonesians. It doesn't grow here. The much is a fashion thing. No, no. 
It is what it is, it, bro. It is what it is, bro. British media is not different to the media of any other country. Yes, it is perhaps uh, BBC is regarded as the most sophisticated forms of, of media. Uh, so props to that. Props to the Beeb for that. Um, but media has always been a form and mechanism of control, controlling the masses, mm. right? Um, you know, Joseph Goebbels, uh, who was um, Hitler's uh, media man, he said, tell the people a lie long enough and they'll start believing it as the truth. Mm. That's what we did with the Jews. One of the things my teacher, Andrew Kelly, big up to Andrew Kelly, G unit, <laughs> he was my news writing teacher when I was doing my NCTJ. And in our first class, he turned around and he said that every bit of news is propaganda and, and every bit of news is partial. Mm. So, so for those of you who are watching that are currently studying journalism or will be studying journalism or have studied journalism, you'll know that the three founding principles of the free press is number one, accountability are you accounting those in power number two to inform and educate the masses and number three to remain impartial whilst doing those two things oh, yeah none but, of this stuff happens none like of this exactly so, so, so essentially huh. andrew kelly who's my news writing teacher he said to me he goes look there's no such thing as impartial news all news is partial Ooh. yeah even five pillars is partial we have an agenda we have Oh, is it that unknown website <laughs> that no one knows about? Why do you keep saying that? It's really hurtful. I mean, once or twice, it's starting to get hurtful now. G <laughs> <laughs> unit? No, 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 you're not getting a G unit. No G unit. Oh. No, no. Bro, you've been on bigger. You're yeah, no, but I've got, I've, I've got the well, because of five yeah. pillars, isn't it? Oh, well, you've well, you should start your own thing, bro. No, Call it four and a half pillars. No, no, you've changed since you got your 100k subscribers. That's the <laughs> truth, yeah? They say numbers change people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, for the people that are watching now, bro, they're just going to be thinking, you know what, I can't even trust the news now. So, where on earth do I learn about these things? Well, look, <clears throat> someone asked me uh, the other day, I gave a lecture at the UCL, and they turned around and they said, Our oh, brother Dilly, can you tell me which news website I can trust? I said, look, I can't give you a news up besides Five Pillars. I can't give you another's. Okay. Yeah, don't even try to come back here. <laughs> I can't <laughs> I can't give you any other websites for you because I read all the news websites. Did you say Dilly or did you say silly? Hmm, he said Dilly. <laughs> oh. Okay. Uh, Maybe even said something else which you can't really oh, say. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so he said uh, <laughs> Mr. Wonkers. Yeah. Anyway. So I said, look, I read the BBC, I read the Guardian, I even read the mail. I'm not proud of it, but I read the mail. I'll, I'll but you're someone who, you, because you're in the system, you know, you have a filter in place. Someone like an uh, innocent viewer that's watching, they may not have the relevant knowledge that you do to realize that, you know what, this is a spin, you know, this guy's unreliable, you know what, this is propaganda, this is this. So you have that filter, the way you're kind of going it, through. It is very difficult, Zishan. It is very difficult to... Uh, I'd say stuff like Al Jazeera then. No, because Al Jazeera has a specific take on... The way it reads news because it's backed by the Qatari government. For for the person who's not immersed in news and there's no reason for them to be up to date with all the different perspectives, you just have to identify a particular outlet which specialises in a particular topic or region. Yeah. So for Muslim current affairs in Britain and the West, I suggest my own news website, fivepillarsuk.com. If it comes from Middle East, Al Jazeera, Middle East Eye. Comes to UK stuff, you've got the Guardian. And you've got the BBC. That is in no shape or form an endorsement of all the journalism that comes from these outlets, mm. except for Five Pillars. Ah. Because obviously, you know... Yeah, it's, it's, it needs it's, the views. <laughs> anyway, so The Guardian is a good shout for newspaper, even online. Al Jazeera is good for Middle East stuff. Um, but also you should be aware that Al Jazeera is, is, is run by and, f and backed by the Qatari government. So a lot of this stuff will be in, line, in, in alignment with Qatari foreign policy. Um, BBC is, you know, it has its problems. It's many problems. It's propaganda. It's very sophisticated and very subtle. Um, but I still watch the BBC. I still tune into the 10 o'clock news, mm. and BBC Newsnight and all that kind of stuff. So watch that. But know, brothers and sisters and friends, that news is there to shape public opinion. It's there to make you think in a particular way. 
And if it continues to tell you something long enough, it's being done so you start believing those things. Now, not all of those things are lies, but not all of those things are entirely true either. Um, and I don't think that's something we should be shocked by, you know. As someone who's been involved in the media, both on a regional level, um, as well as a commentator on the mainstream press, as well as running in Muslim media, people, we're here to shape how you think. We're here to influence what you think. That's just the role of the media. Uh, but at the same time, we're doing it because we essentially believe it to be the truth. And by we, I'm talking about at least from a Muslim perspective, right? Um, we would never make up lies and present it to the, the ummah or the masses by and large and present it as the truth. We would never do that. It, it's haram first and foremost. And two, we'd fall into trouble. Um, but that's not to say that media outlets have not done that and are not doing that. Where they bend the truth. They over-exaggerate certain things, they disproportionately focus on one thing over the other, they omit certain truths, and that's the kind of journalism they deliver. What on earth do we do? About? It's, it seems like, and I, justifiably, with, with everything that's going wrong, I would say, what on earth does the layman do? Because me, as, as uh, just a regular Joe, the understanding I have is not, the, the experience in the mainstream media but I'm thinking more people need to start practicing their religion and bloody waking up in terms of how to do something on a global level or on a or, or on a platform where it actually matters that's where my ideas then trail off look we have Muslims in the West and in the Muslim majority world inshallah loads of different kinds of Muslims will be watching this podcast from different backgrounds from different realities uh, who are living under different circumstances mm. Uh, with regards to the kind of legacy that you want to leave on this earth, it has to be one which will help you in the akhirah, right? Whether it is YouTube videos, whether it's news and media or activism or gaining knowledge and then teaching it and sharing it with others, whatever it may be. The point here is, and I said this, and I've said this a number of times to a number of brothers and sisters who I've spoken to at universities, that we are living in a critical time in the Ummah's history, a time which, wallahi, will go down, future generations will read about this particular period and think, wow, what a unique time to live in. What unique circumstances and challenges Muslims all around the world faced in this particular period. Mm. So we want to be make sure that we are not mere bystanders. We are not mere bystanders uh, at a period where our ajr and the rewards for doing uh, certain acts would be multiplied. Sim oh, no. Simply due to the hardship of the environment, mm. right? Um, brothers and sisters, whatever field you, you're involved in, excel in it and use it for the benefit of the Ummah and society by and large. Whether it is, you know, medicine, healthcare, whether you are a YouTuber, a blogger, or a vlogger, whether you are an activist or a student of knowledge, whatever it may be, use whatever knowledge and experience that you've attained for the benefit of others. We know from the hadith uh, of the beloved Prophet wasallam, saying that it is actually f befitting of the Muslims to benefit others. Yeah? And this is something which is pleasing to Allah. But we are also living at a time where we have to start seeing ourselves as Muslims beyond ritualistic acts. As much as prayer is the prayer and fasting and hajj and giving zakah, are the fundamental rituals and uh, fara'ids of our, of, of our religion, there are things which are happening in our time right now which, which requires us to act. And acting for the sake of khair and goodness is from our religion. I said earlier on in the podcast that Allah has told us in the Qur'an that He's raised us as the best nation from amongst mankind because we enjoin in good and forbid evil. And we also know from the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ about, you know, trying to change munkar with your hands or speaking out against it. We know about the hadith about the best form of jihad being a word of truth to a tyrannical ruler. Therefore, we get from that to stick up for causes uh, and, and speak out against just injustice and oppression. At a time where these things are happening at an industrial scale, wherever we look, whether it's locally in our own towns, whether it's nationally with what's happening in the UK, with the number of homeless, with the number of people that are resorting to food banks, with the number of people uh, that are going through genuine hardship, mental health issues, and the elderly who are dying in the winter months, wherever it may be, use your Islam, use your knowledge, 
use the experience that you have for the benefit of this ummah and the society by and large you know whatever field it is in excel in it because at the end of the day we are all gatekeepers of jannah we are all gatekeepers of the truth mm. and we all have a duty to it do not be a bystander do not be someone who works nine to five you know gets their salary goes to sleep eat poop and repeat that's yeah. not that's that's not life man it yeah. really isn't you know whether you're on a salary of 20k or 120k the eat sleep and repeat lifestyle you're gonna you'll regret it on the day of judgment yeah you know we, we will all regret it because because on, on the day of judgment is the day where we ask allah to send us back so we can do more all right guys um we hope you benefited from this podcast jazakallah khair to our friend Dili who's traveled and alhamdulillah it is through the journey of this podcast that I was able to meet and reach out to him had it not been through this podcast we probably wouldn't have met um, anytime soon um, so alhamdulillah but well, it's only obvious though no, it's true, it's true, yeah. Yeah. Um, definitely leave your feedback and inshallah join us again on Declassified Assalamu alaikum Wa alaikum as